The story about Christopher Columbus's voyages began with the lobbying effort he engaged in for funding his journey. He petitioned the Catholic monarchs of Castile Aragon, Spain's predecessor, and Portugal. Why Portugal? Well, during the mid 15th century, Portugal was the dominant naval power on the Iberian Peninsula. The area occupied by current day Spain was divided between many Spanish speaking kingdoms. Besides fighting each other, they were also having border disputes with the Moorish Kingdom of Grenada to the south. So Columbus approached King John II of Portugal with the proposal for a western route to Asia. Now as mentioned in the previous video, we are aware of Columbus's poor judgment regarding the size of the earth. King John's experts also concurred that the estimated distance to Asia was significantly lower than generally and correctly believed at the time and advised the king to reject his proposal. Moreover, Bartolomeu Diaz had just returned to Portugal in 1488 after rounding the southern tip of Africa, which allowed Portugal to ply the much closer eastern route to Asia. Columbus, still confident, moved on to find other monarchs to fund his voyage. Meanwhile, on the Spanish side of Iberia, relative peace was restored with the marriage of Queen Isabella of Castile and King Ferdinand II of Aragon in 1469. Additionally, the Grenada War from 1482 started the culmination of the Reconquista with Christian dominance on the Iberian Peninsula. With their kingdoms relatively stable, the Spanish monarchs started building a navy to compete with the neighboring Catholic monarchy of Portugal. So Columbus submitted his proposal to Queen Isabella, who handed it to a committee to determine the feasibility and as expected, was once again rejected on the basis of gross miscalculation of distance. Despite the impracticality, the monarchs decided to hedge their bets. The eastern route to Asia was already being dominated by Portugal, and they didn't want the chance for the western route to fall in the hands of their competition. So they decided to give Columbus an annual salary of a sailor. Then, in 1492, shortly after the Spanish forces conquered Grenada, Columbus was summoned back to the Castilian court. The details of his voyage agreements were determined, including giving Columbus titles such as Admiral of the Ocean Sea and Viceroy and Governor of all colonized lands, as well as 10% of the revenues from all newly colonized lands in perpetuity. So finally, with the details determined, Columbus departed for his first voyage with three ships. A large ship or now called the Santa Maria, a caravel named the Santa Clara, which was nicknamed the Nina, and another caravel whose name is lost, but is known as the Painted One or the Pinta. On August 3rd, 1492, the three ships sailed down the Rio Tinto into the Atlantic Ocean. They arrived at the Canary Islands off the coast of West Africa on August 9th, 1492. Here, on the island of Grand Canary, the crew replaced the rudder of the Pinta, which broke three days into the journey. On September 2nd, three ships arrived at La Gomera, where their provisions were secured for the westward exploration into the ocean sea. On September 6th, they sailed into the west on a hope and a prayer that they will reach Asia before their provisions run out and they starve to death out in the open ocean. Now if we assume for a moment that the continents of the Americas and the islands of the Caribbean didn't exist, Columbus and his crews would have run out of food and drinking water right around the time they would have reached the 80th meridian west, which passes through Panama. However, luck smiled upon him and his crew, and on October 11th, a little over a month after Columbus and his crew sailed from the Canary Islands, and two months after they sailed down the Rio Dinto, land was sighted. Quick sidebar. A Spanish sailor aboard the Pinta named Rodrigo de Triana is said to have sighted land first. Columbus, who was aboard the Santa Maria, acknowledged this as well in his diary, but added the claim that he had sighted land four hours earlier but didn't tell anybody because he wasn't sure. The claim of sighting land first allowed Columbus to retain a reward from the crown. Back to the voyage. The land that Columbus sighted is presumed to be an island in the Bahamas called Guanahani by the indigenous residents. However, Columbus renamed it after Christ the Savior, San Salvador, setting a precedence where European explorers renamed territories all over the Western Hemisphere. He also encountered indigenous people from the Lucayan, Taino, and Arawak tribes and went right ahead to start calling them Indios, believing that he had landed on the islands of the East Indies. Seeing the local Arawak with gold ornaments on their ears, he took them prisoner, hoping they would lead him to their source of gold. 
He continued to explore the nearby islands and landed on the coast of Cuba on October 28th. After exploring the eastern coast of Cuba, the Pinta took a different route than the other ships. Columbus, still on board the Santa Maria, landed on the island that he named and still remains to this day, Hispaniola. Little did he know that in his first voyage itself, he landed on the two largest islands in the Caribbean, Cuba and Hispaniola. Then, on December 25th, 1492, Santa Maria ran aground on the northwestern coast of Hispaniola and had to be abandoned. Columbus received the permission of the local Taino people to leave behind 39 of his men to create the first European settlement in the Caribbean called La Navidad. It is believed that wood from the Santa Maria was used in the construction of the settlement. He then continued sailing along the northern coast of Hispaniola on the Nina until the Pinta rejoined them on January 6th. Together, the two ships sailed along the coast until they reached what would be their last stop in the Rincon Bay of Hispaniola. Here, on January 13th, they encountered the first violent resistance of their voyage from the indigenous Ciguayos, where a bad trade deal resulted in arrows being fired and two Ciguayos getting wounded. On January 16th, three months after first landing in the Americas, the Nina and Pinta started their journey back to Spain. On February 13th, they encountered a rough storm during which the two ships got separated. Two days later, they spotted the Azores and anchored off the shore of the Santa Maria Island. Here, half the crew took a boat to the mainland in hopes of getting more provisions and water for their journey onwards to Spain. Additionally, they wanted to make a pilgrimage to the nearest church of Our Lady for sparing them in the storm. The Azores, at the time, as it still is today, was part of Portugal. The captain of the island, João de Castanheira, believing that the sailors were pirates, arrested the crew members who came ashore. He then took over the boat they landed in and went to the Nina to demand Columbus and the other crew members to turn themselves in, to which Columbus said, nah -uh. This went on for a couple of days, after which Castanheira gave in and released the crew members he earlier arrested, allowing them to go back to the ships. On February 23rd, Columbus left the Azores for Castilian Spain, but another storm forced him to land once again on Portuguese territory, this time at Lisbon on March 4th. Fully aware that, unlike with Castanera, he couldn't play chicken with the King of Portugal, he instead wrote to King John II, asking permission to stay before heading over to Castile. The King agreed to meet with him, but after being told of Columbus's travels, considered the voyage to be in violation of the Treaty of Alcazoas. Later on, he would use this violation as leverage against the Castile Aragon monarchs during a mediation conducted by Pope Alexander VI. But that is a story for another time. After a week, Columbus left Lisbon and arrived back in Spain on March 15, 1493, over seven months after he had departed from Spain, thus completing his first voyage to the Americas. To summarize the trip in Columbus's own words, here are a few translated excerpts from his letter to the Spanish monarchs following his arrival in Spain. On the 33rd day after leaving Cadiz, I came into the Indian Ocean, where I discovered many islands inhabited by numerous people. They are very guileless and honest and very liberal of all they have. No one refuses the asker anything that he possesses. On the contrary, they themselves invite us to ask for it. I gave them many beautiful and pleasing things, which I had brought with me for no return whatever in order to win their affection and that they might become Christians and inclined to love our king and queen and princes and all the people of Spain. The stated purpose for the second voyage was to convert the indigenous people to Christianity in the name of the Catholic monarchs of Castile and Aragon. This time, Columbus was given a much larger fleet, comprising of two naus and 15 caravels, including the Nina, which was to be the first ship to return to the New World. On September 25, 1493, the fleet sailed from Cadiz on the southwestern coast of Spain. This time, the fleet did not stop by the Canary Islands, but instead sailed straight 
across the ocean sea. On November 3rd, 1493, they landed on an island that Columbus immediately renamed and is known to this day as Dominica. He continued to sail north along the Lesser Antilles, renaming islands as he came across them. Some of these names, or a version of those, are used even today, including Montserrat, Antigua, St. Croix, and the Virgin Islands. On November 19th, he arrived at what is today known as Puerto Rico. Here, one of Columbus's crew members recounts the Europeans were able to rescue some women and children who were being held captive for the purpose of sexual slavery by a native Carib tribe. On November 22nd, Columbus returned to the island of Hispaniola and to La Navidad, the settlement he had created during the first voyage with 39 men and the wood from the hull of the Santa Maria. However, he learned that the men he had left behind had gotten into to a dispute with the natives and were all killed. Columbus charged a Taino chief named Kaunabo with the killing of his men and the subsequent capture of Kaunabo in 1494 would lead to the first native uprising against the Europeans in the Americas. Having lost La Navidad, Columbus established a new settlement which would also remain short-lived called La Isabella. He looked for some more gold and established a fort in the interior of the island. On April 24th, he left Hispaniola and arrived on the southeastern coast of Cuba on April 30th. Following this, he sailed across to the island of Jamaica, reaching the coast on May 5th. Sailing for a few days along the northwestern coast of Jamaica, he continued back to Cuba and sailed along its southern coast before heading back to Jamaica and then Hispaniola. Interestingly, he didn't circumnavigate Cuba and therefore thought it was a peninsula of China rather than an island. Columbus arrived back on Hispaniola on August 20th and continued to explore the coast. He felt seriously ill by the end of September, causing his men to land back at La Isabella. Having spent almost a year and failing to find the riches and gold he had promised the monarchs, as well as the settlers, Columbus decided to look at other methods to generate revenue. He sent a letter to the monarchs proposing to enslave some natives, such as the more hostile Caribs. This proposal was refused by the crown, but that didn't stop him from enslaving 1600 Arawaks, who were peaceful and welcoming to the Europeans. 560 of these slaves were sent to Spain, of which only 360 survived the journey. Following legal proceedings in Spain, the survivors were ordered to be released and sent back to their native lands, only to be re-enslaved by Columbus and his men. He also set up forced labor camps for the natives on the island that, in the words of his son Ferdinand, is described as follows. In the Seba, where the gold mines were, every person of 14 years of age or upward was to pay a large hawk's bell of gold dust. All others were each to pay 25 pounds of cotton. Whenever an Indian delivered his tribute, he was to receive a brass or copper token which he must wear about his neck as proof that he had made his payment. Any Indian found without such a token was to be punished. The natives who were found without a copper token had their hands cut off, leading to many of them bleeding to death. Furthermore, the belief of abundance of gold on the island turned out to be a myth. Therefore, a lot of natives could never meet the quotas set up by Columbus, resulting in many of them committing suicide. Meanwhile, the Spanish settlers were stricken with disease and famine, causing nearly two-thirds of them to die since their arrival on the island. The conditions were nothing like the lofty and beautiful mountains, great farms, groves and fields, most fertile both for cultivation and for pasturage, as described by Columbus after his first voyage. Settlers wrote to the sovereigns, describing the decrepit conditions on the islands and the cruelties on the natives conducted by Columbus's captain and appointees. However, Columbus's own letters still provided the rosy picture he had originally described to them. Unsure of which account to believe, they decided to send Juan de Aguado as special commissioner along with limited provisions for the settlements to investigate and report back. When Aguado arrived at Hispaniola, he found the Spanish colonists, including Columbus, to be severely ill. The supplies that he brought from Spain were rapidly dwindling and so Columbus decided to head back to Spain to ask for more help from the monarchs. He prepared two ships, one for himself and one for Aguado, along with 200 disillusioned Spanish colonists and 30 native prisoners. He left Hispaniola on 10th March 1496, roughly two and a half years since his second arrival to the islands, and reached Cadiz on 11 June 1496, marking the end of his second voyage. 
After his return from his second voyage in 1496, Columbus spent the next two years defending himself against the accusations made by the Spanish settlers. He urged the Spanish monarchs to resupply the island of Hispaniola, convinced that a westward route to China and the Indies were almost within their grasp. The monarchs were somewhat skeptical, but acquiesced to the demand, considering the amount of time and money invested already, coupled with the fact that new islands were discovered by Columbus in their name. However, they provided Columbus with a much smaller fleet this time, of only six ships. The mission for the third voyage was to resupply settlements on the island of Hispaniola, continue exploration for a westward route to the Indies, and continue the search for new islands to claim in the name of the Spanish monarchs. By this time, the Pope had already helped broker an arrangement between the Spanish monarchs of Castile Aragon and King John II of Portugal, on which King would hold claim to the lands that would be newly discovered during westward exploration. So on May 30th, 1498, Columbus left Sanlúcar, Spain with six ships for his third voyage. Their first stop was the Portuguese islands of Porto Santo and Madeira. From here, ships sailed south to the Canary Islands, reaching their shores on June 19th. Here, the fleet split up with three ships sailing directly to Hispaniola to bring much-needed supplies and reinforcements. The remaining three ships sailed under Columbus's command down to Cape Verde with the goal of exploring the regions further south from Hispaniola. On July 4th, the three ships left the Cape Verde Islands and sailed west to once again explore new lands but encountered the doldrums of the Atlantic. Another quick sidebar, the doldrums are what sailors call the intertropical convergence zone. This weather phenomena is marked by monotonous windless weather and occurs near the equator. Given that wind was the primary source of propulsion for ships in those days, being in the doldrums can cause fleets to be stuck for days while exhausting food supplies and drinking water for the crew. That is exactly what Columbus and his crew encountered, having been able to travel only 120 leagues in 9 days. For reference, the distance from Cape Verde to Hispaniola is about 922 leagues, but their luck improved and the winds picked up on July 22nd. Drinking water was running dangerously low on the ship. And Columbus set a course for the island of Dominica, which he had found during the last voyage. On July 31st, he sighted an island with three prominent hills, leading him to rename this island after the Holy Trinity as Trinidad. There, the crew was able to procure more fresh water, and the next day on August 1st, Columbus and his crew sailed over to the mouth of the Orinoco River in what is today Venezuela. They did not disembark from their ship, but made observations about the topography of the land as well as the sheer volume of water that was being sent into the ocean from the Orinoco River. These observations led them to accurately believe that the land that they saw was a continent and not just another island. However, he still retained the belief that this was part of Asia. From August 2nd to August 12th, he continued sailing in the Gulf of Paria, back and forth between Trinidad and South America. During this time, he encountered many tribes from whom he received various items, including pearls, maize wine, and fresh water. From here, he sailed to the island of Margarita, reaching there on August 14th. By then, Columbus was in poor health and determined to head back to Hispaniola. He reached there five days later on August 19th to find that his brother Bartholomew had abandoned the settlement at La Isabella and moved the headquarters to Santo Domingo. Furthermore, the Spanish settlers were in rebellion against the rule of Columbus and his brothers. They accused him of misleading them with false promises of gold and riches, which were not to be found on Hispaniola. Additionally, the clergy were enraged at Columbus's attempts to profit from the enslavement and sale of the native people, considering their mission of converting them to Christianity. Hearing these reports, on May 21st, 1499, the monarchs assigned Francisco de Bobadilla as judge for the affairs being conducted on the island of Hispaniola. The following year in June, Bobadilla sailed to Hispaniola to relieve Columbus of his position and powers and investigate the accusations against him. Within days of his arrival, on August 23rd, Bobadilla arrested the Columbus brothers, Christopher, Bartholomew, and Diego, imprisoned them, and seized their personal properties on the charges of being rebellious subjects of the Spanish crown. In early October 1500, the three brothers were put on a ship to Spain to face trial for the accusations levied against them. They arrived in Cadiz on October 30th, 1500, bringing the third voyage of Columbus to an end.
The race for a sea route to the Indies was won by the Portuguese when Vasco da Gama returned from India in September 1499, having sailed around Africa. Columbus, on the other hand, had little to show for his half a decade rule as the governor of his so-called Indies. The Spanish monarchs were forced to constantly invest more money and effort in colonizing the newly found lands, with little return and no viable route to the real Indies. Columbus now stood on trial for accusations of mismanagement, enslavement, and rebellion against the monarchy. Here is an excerpt of what Columbus wrote in his own defense. I have placed under their sovereignty more land than there is in Africa and Europe, and more than 1700 islands. In seven years, I, by the divine will, made that conquest. At a time when I was entitled to expect rewards and retirement, I was incontinently arrested and sent home loaded with chains. The accusation was brought out of malice on the basis of charges made by civilians who had revolted and wished to take possession on the land. I beg your graces, with the zeal of faithful Christians in whom their highnesses have confidence, to read all my papers and to consider how I, who came from so far to serve these princes, now at the end of my days, have been despoiled of my honor and my property without cause, wherein is neither justice nor mercy. King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella summoned Columbus and his brothers to the Alhambra Palace in Grenada, where he admitted to his faults and begged for forgiveness from the monarchs. They took pity on him and ordered him and his brothers to be freed. However, he would be stripped of his title of Governor of the Indies, and Nicolas de Ovando was named the new governor. On September 27, 1501, Bobadilla was ordered by royal mandate to return Columbus's possessions. This legal reprieve, though, did not dampen his ambitions. Still convinced that there is a western route to Asia, Columbus lobbied the sovereigns to fund one last voyage to India. The monarchs reluctantly agreed but wanted to avoid any potential conflicts in authority if Columbus is allowed back on Hispaniola. So they stipulated that Columbus must steer clear of Hispaniola and instead focus only on finding the westward passage to the Indies. The mission of this voyage was to find the Strait of Malacca and finally establish the long-promised trading route to India. Columbus agreed to this condition and on March 14, 1502, sailed with four ships and 147 men from the port of Cadiz. His first stop on his last voyage was to Arzilla on the Moroccan coast, where he went to rescue Portuguese soldiers who were besieged by the Moors. From here, the Atlantic trade winds allowed him to cross the ocean in 20 days, leading him to land on the island of Martinique on June 15. For the next few days, Columbus sailed once again along the islands of the Lesser Antilles until, based on the weather conditions, he anticipated that a hurricane was brewing. His only viable refuge being Hispaniola, he charted a course to the island despite having explicit instructions not to land there. He arrived at Santo Domingo on June 29th, but as per royal decree, was denied port. Meanwhile, the new governor of Hispaniola, Nicolas de Ovando, was planning to send a large fleet of 20 ships back to Spain, along with Francisco de Bobadilla. These ships bore treasures and gold that were taken from the islands, including Columbus's share of the gold, based on the arrangement he had with the monarchs. Columbus warned them about the impending hurricane, but Ovando refused to believe him and sent the fleet into the sea. Almost the entire fleet, including the ship with Bobadilla on board, was lost to the storm. Columbus was able to shelter his ships in a nearby estuary, protecting them from the hurricane. As luck would have it, the only ship that made it back to Spain from the fleet sent by Orlando was the one carrying Columbus's share of gold. Once the hurricane subsided, Columbus sailed with his crew to Jamaica and then on to the southwest coast of Cuba to replenish their stocks before continuing their mission of exploration. On July 30th, 1502, he arrived on the island of Guanaja, off the coast of Honduras. Here they encountered friendly natives who introduced them for the first time to the cacao plant, which forms the basis of chocolate. Columbus recounts a native elder described to him seeing people with swords and horses. For some reason, this convinced Columbus that he was less than a 10-day journey to the river Ganga. Yes, that Ganga. On August 14th, Columbus landed on the mainland in what is present-day Honduras. He spent two months sailing south along this coast, looking for the opening that would be his Strait of Malacca, before arriving at Almirante Bay in Panama on October 16th. Here, the natives informed them of another ocean that was just a 10-day march down south. 
This convinced Columbus that he was very close to the Strait of Malacca and set up a garrison on the mouth of the Belen River in January 1503. Yet over the next four months, Columbus and his crew were not able to find this other ocean. Instead, they searched the nearby land for gold and valuables, leading them to become increasingly adversarial with the natives and causing attacks on his ships. This includes a large attack on April 6th, which caused Columbus to abandon one of his ships due to damage. With the three remaining ships, he sailed from Panama, intending to stop at Hispaniola before sailing back to Spain. On May 10th, he sighted the Cayman Islands and named one of them Las Tortugas on account of the numerous turtles on the shores. His ships once again encountered a great storm off the coast of Cuba. They made it as far as Jamaica before all the ships had to be beached on June 25th, 1503. Here, Columbus and his crew remained stranded for almost a year. A Spanish sailor and his crew named Diego Mendez paddled a canoe along with some natives to seek help from Hispaniola. However, Hispaniola's governor, Nicolas de Ovando, refused to help Columbus based on the royal decree banning him from the island. Diego Mendez pleaded with the governor for months and each time his request was denied. Finally, on June 29, 1504, Nicolas de Ovando agreed to help Columbus and sent a caravel for him and his crew. Of the 147 that sailed from Spain with Columbus, only 110 survived to board this caravel. Due to strong opposing winds, it took another 45 days for this caravel to reach Hispaniola. 38 of the 110 on board the caravel decided to stay back on Hispaniola. The remaining men, along with Columbus, departed on September 11, 1504. They reached San Lucar on November 7, 1504, culminating the fourth and final journey of Columbus to the Americas. Following his return to Spain, Columbus spent the remainder of his life appealing to King Ferdinand II to regain his lost titles. While his titles of Viceroy and Governor were not restored, Ferdinand agreed to give him 2% of the riches from the so-called Indies, which was a substantial sum, allowing his sons a lifestyle of nobility. A year after he returned from the Americas for the final time, Columbus became severely ill, possibly due to Reiter's syndrome, which causes arthritis along with eye and urinary tract disorders. On May 20th, 1506, he passed away at the age of 56, leaving a legacy of exploration, ambition, as well as pillaging and ruthlessness. Till his dying breath, however, and having spent nearly 10 years on the islands, he was completely convinced that he was within touching distance of Asia, despite being half a world away.